start recording so i'll do that i'll do that um he joined Quran institute for a couple of years after his phd and returned in 2013 to mit as a as a packer uh he's received numerous awards for uh his research uh three young investigator awards from the navy, from the navy Army, and the air force research offices a sloan research fellowship as well as budusaki Young Scientist Award in Mathematics, to name just, just a few. Uh, his research interests are very broad, but um, generally speaking, it's in the area of applied dynamical systems, uncertainty, quantification, extreme events, um, and uh, Bayesian optimization. Uh, today, he will talk to us about the likelihood weighted active learning with application to Bayesian optimization, uncertainty, quantification, and decision making in high dimensions. dimensions. Just a full disclosure, I have to mention also that he suffered for a few years as my uh, postdoc mentor, and it's a great pleasure, pleasure to have him now to give a talk to us. Um, Themis, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed, for the nice uh, invitation. Uh, and um, it's, it's a pleasure uh, to give this talk. And um, thank you also for the introduction. Um, so before I start, I want to emphasize that uh, if, if you have any questions, you can ask them the moment you have them. Uh, if you write on the chat, I would ask Mohammed to interrupt me and uh, transfer the question because I cannot, I don't have two monitors, I have only one. So today uh, I want to uh, talk about um, some recent work we have done on um, likelihood weighted we call it on active learning so active learning i will uh, get into the details but the idea is that we have a very expensive uh, you can call it a box like this can be a simulation or uh, some type of experiment and um, we want to find certain properties of this system right this could be the statistics of the system one particular uh, aspect of, of statistics that I'm interested in is extreme event statistics, like the tails, and these are hard to find because you have to wait for a really, really long time to simulate the system for a very long time to get the statistics, or it could be an optimum, right? Uh, optimal behavior, optimal combination of parameters. So we are trying to develop a model agnostic, uh, I have to admit, um, algorithms that aim to do that as efficient as possible. And when I say efficient, I mean with the, with the shortest uh, amount of simulations or experiments uh, possible, right? The smallest amount. So um, let me give you a few more concrete examples. So hopefully, you know, the idea will be more clear. Uh, resilience and reliability in ocean engineering. So these are two typical problems in ocean engineering. Uh, coastal region uh, subjected to you know big waves during a storm. Uh, the other is uh, ship rolling motions. Uh, here you see an actual footage, right? That's a container ship. Uh, it's not like a terrible storm in the sense of the surrounding waves are are not you know insane, but still the non-linear interaction between the ship and uh, the ocean waves result in this uh, very, very big rolling angle, which has profound uh, implications. So what are we interested uh, for this? Like, what, what is our goal, right? Obviously, these two systems are characterized by uncertainty, and therefore, it's not meaningful to try to identify you know, one critical condition or another critical condition. We are more primarily interested on the statistics of these sort of dangerous conditions. So what is the input variable, if you want? That, that would be the random vector describing the waves, right? We have a big number of waves. Uh, so typically for this type of problems, we have like the random, the spectrum is predefined. We are changing randomly the phases of the different harmonics. And um, assuming we know what is the wave field, then we have an experiment or some sort of simulator, and we are able to compute the vector describing either the structural response or the ship motion, or anyway, the quantity of interest. So this, this is an expensive calculation, right? And I have this ratio here for those who are not familiar with, with these problems. 
to get a sense of what I mean expensive. So this is the time for computation uh, divided by the time interval of the computation, right? So this is clock time, if you want, that it takes for the processor to, to complete the calculation. And this is the time interval of the computation. For three DCFD solvers, um, this is at the order of, or, of one, right? Can be two. Potential solvers, much faster. It's uh, an order of magnitude smaller, two orders of magnitude smaller. But in any case, classification societies, the Navy, they need to characterize the events with returning periods of, of th these days of 1,000 years, right? So you have to basically um, divide this number with this number, and that will give you the time it takes for a single processor to compute this calculation. So this is expensive, right? And Excuse me, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Yes, go ahead. The returning period, does is that the prediction time, how far you have to predict? Uh, yes, well, it's the time it takes until this critical, like the events that we're interested in, uh, can occur. So these events can happen once every hundred years or once every thousand years. And this is what we are interested in. We are interested to identify the form of these events, right? And 1,000 years may seem like a long time, but if you are not lucky, it can happen much earlier. So it's, it, it depends. Then you may have a big fleet of, of ships, right? Then it may happen also much earlier. So the, that's why you will not hear, you know, a ship owner being interested in the 1,000 uh, year event. But if you're a classification society and you're owning you know, 500 ships or 5,000 ships, then, you know, one of them may not be as, as, as lucky. So effect of climate change, the problem again is similar. You have some random vector describing the large scales and this is obtained by GCM's global circulation models to a good degree. Uh, and then you have another vector describing the small scales for a climate model of uh, with, with uh, good resolution of 0 0.25 degrees with 1600 cores. The R, this ratio I described before, is close to one. So one day is more or less uh, of simulation. It takes one day of, um, uh, of computing time. And policymakers, again, they need probability for events happening once every thousand years, right? So this is, again, another variation of the problem. And then there are problems in engineering, like drug reduction, um, optimization, basically in complex fluid flows. This is uh, a nice prototype system. It's called the fluidic pinball, where you, you rotate the cylinder so that you eventually reduce the drug. And then another experiment that I will talk about involves a turbulent jet uh, where again, the idea is to um, maximize mixing. So you have a turbulent Z, the one that you see here. And as I said, this is an actual experiment. And then you have perpendicular to this turbulent Z, you have mini jets that actuate the big jet. And again, the idea is to try to get maximum mixing downstream. So the question is how would you, what kind of control law you would consider to achieve a specific objective. This is an optimization problem in contrast to the previous ones, which were uh, uncertain quantification problems. So um, <clears throat> let me uh, skip that for in the interest of time. I want to uh, mention before I start some popular answer quantification optimization methods, at least in the context of engineering, right, in, in fluids. So uh, very popular method for this type of problems is reduced order models, right? You build a reduced order model, you hope that it actually, you know, it, it um, represents the dynamics to a good degree. And then instead of running the full model or the full experiment, you run the reduced order model in the Monte Carlo sense uh, and you collect statistics. Important sampling, a very popular method, which of course it has its caveats. Polynomial chaos, perhaps some, somewhere uh, you know, older, uh, several, a couple of decades ago. Linearization and wiener scene more popular in the civil engineering community and statistical linearization. So these are, again, not all of the methods available for uncertain quantification, but if you want some large classes of, of those. 
And then in optimization, we have a joint method, of course, surrogate-based genetic algorithms and Bayesian optimization. I will be talking primarily on Bayesian optimization. So <clears throat> what is the special twist here, right? We, as I mentioned, we are interested on extreme events. We are interested to, uh, extreme events takes a really long time to, to find, to simulate. And our goal, because we are dealing with very expensive models, we want to minimize the number of experiment simulations. How are we gonna do that? What is the fundamental idea? Instead of trying to characterize the full thing, the full output, we will be interested to identify those parameters that contribute to specific outputs, not everything. So we will try to emphasize or identify the input or the variables that actually modified the output that we're interested in. So let me say a few words about active learning because that's the foundation based on which we will build our tools. Uh, active learning is essentially the idea of identifying good data so you can build a good model, right? So what is the idea? You start with some initial data, um, input output, X is the input, Y is the output, right, you have N of those pairs, you do some type of probabilistic regression, you can keep in mind Gaussian process regression. Um, the important thing here, and I emphasize probabilistic, is that you cannot do a simple interpolation. So you cannot do a deterministic, if you want regression. You also want confidence bounds for active learning to work. So in other words, you see here, I have the points x1, x2, x3, right? I have my regression, the blue curve. I also need some confidence intervals. And Gaussian process regression is one of those methods that gives you for free, essentially, um, confidence intervals. So assuming you know you have an idea based on your data of um, the regression curve and the confidence intervals, then the next question is, OK, what is the next most informative experiment that I should carry? Or what is the next X that I should run in my you know, device or experimental facility so that I have the best possible convergence for the statistics or the optimization that I want to do? So you have to identify criteria on selecting this new input, as we call it, right? And this is the acquisition function that I will talk uh, in a second. And this is, if you want, the core of our effort, like building a good acquisition function so that we get fast and certain quantification, efficient and certain quantification, or efficient optimization. After we identify with the criterion we choose the next input point, of course, we run the experiment with input this new point, and then we complement the data and we repeat this cycle until we are ready to you know, use the, regress, the reduced order model either for identifying the risk from the tails or do optimization. Okay, a few words for those who may not be familiar with Gaussian process regression. As I said, Gaussian process regression is, you can think of it as an interpolation uh, approach. You have your data points, right, X and Y. You have, you essentially assume that your Y, your unknown function has a Gaussian prior, if you have no data, zero mean Gaussian prior with some kernel, some covariance, and conditioning this Gaussian uh, prior on the data, you can write down in a closed form the posterior for, which is also Gaussian, um, given the data, right? So, the posterior will be given by, as you can see, an expression for the mean, uh, which of course involves the input and output data points. And there is also an expression for the posterior covariance from which we can obtain the variance. So the result will be a curve like the one I show you, or a hypersurface, um, uh, which again, it will have some mean and it will also have some uh, variance. Obviously, the variance it goes to zero, uh, assuming that your observations, your data points uh, have no noise, and it's in increasing as we move away from uh, the data points. Uh, there are other options for probabilistic regression. 
uh, like neural network with random initial weights or other uh, approaches. But today we will primarily use uh, Gaussian process regression. I, I also have some examples for neural networks because they scale much better with dimensionality. Okay, so I want to focus now on the acquisition function. That's the core of this, uh, of, of this work. So as I said, the key question is how should I, I suppose I have some data points, as you can see here, I have my regression, right? Um, and then I imagine a new hypothetical point this is the red one, X star. And the question is, where should I place that? Okay. Now you see that as I move X star, of course, I don't want to, to run the experiment yet. So I don't know what is the real Y star. What I can guess for Y star is that it's close to my regression curve. So that, of course, if I assume that, if I assume that for X star, the output is Y of X star, I will not change the regression. But what I will change are the confidence intervals. You see that wherever I place this new hypothetical point, the um, variance will go to zero or very, very small. So how should I choose X star? Well, an obvious choice uh, that has been used heavily in the active learning uh, literature is to try to minimize the posterior variance, right? So I will basically place it wherever I have maximum uncertainty, then I can go and pick a new point there. Okay, that's reasonable. Another approach is to choose X star so that the uh, area under this, uh, like under this confidence interval curve, it's get, it gets minimized. In fact, I can also multiply with the probability test function of X to exclude exotic regions for X. So that's the integrated variance reduction, also a very popular criterion. And uh, a third one that it's probably harder to, to implement in terms of computational cost is mutual information. I basically choose X star so that the mutual information between the input PDF and the output uh, variables, the input variable and the output variable is, uh, is um, maximized. So these are some very popular choices uh, and there are important drawbacks. And let me first clarify what are these drawbacks for the first two. So for uncertainty sampling and integrated variance reduction, you see that we are basically relying on the variance, right? Sigma N of X. The problem with variance is that it does not really take into account uh, the value of Y. So let me go back one slide and emphasize that the variance in Gaussian plus regression, it basically depends on the X coordinates of your data points. It does not really see anything related to Y. What does mean is that even if you have a function that has zero dependence on a particular variable, your, this criteria will still tell you to try to sample over these dimensions, despite the fact that the function has no uh, dependence on those, right? So you see that KN depends only on capital X, which means that the variance is independent of the actual value of the function Y, which means that you are spending a lot of resources exploring places that are completely relevant to the output. The same thing happens with neutral information. In fact, we have shown recently uh, that the asymptotic behavior of this neutral information quantity as sigma gets smaller, it's more or less equivalent to the integrated advanced reduction. So a part of the fact that neutral information is extremely hard to compute, especially as the dimensionality of X gets larger, in practice, you cannot go more than two, maximum three dimensions. Um, it, you don't really gain much. So, we want to focus on a criterion that respects the output, right? That the output is important. And what was the motivation for this? The motivation was- I'm so sorry to, to, to interrupt again. I have a very stupid question. Can't you just, you know, you have a couple of data points, function values, can't you just see where the gradient is largest? Well, again, you may be able to do that. And there are efforts, you know, that try to, to focus on the gradient. The gradient is not always the answer because you may have a noisy output, right? So it still may send you to an irrelevant place. 
There are efforts that also have tried to use why the magnitude of the output. Um, but again, there you have to use certain weights to try to see what is most important, the output or the uncertainty. And then you go to like a very uh, popular uh, dilemma or famous dilemma of exploration versus exploitation. Exploration is trying to reduce the variance. Exploitation is trying to take advantage of, you know, the output. Um, we're trying to do this in a more, uh, how can I say, rigorous, automatic way so that we don't have to specify the, these weights but instead we will be able to have a cleaner uh, if you want result that yeah and also prove some optimality that's the other point that we'll try to to prove that um, whatever we choose is going to be optimal and i will describe the sense of optimality uh, that's i think that's a good question so, so I, i'm trying to give a little bit of the of the physical motivation where where we start why we start thinking this way and the reason was um some of the work we have done in fact a lot of this work with with mohammed through his uh during his mit years um where we were exploring systems uh, fluid dynamicals i mean fluid dynamics uh, problems um where the typical picture that one sees in this case for a turbulent problem uh, exhibiting extreme events is an attractor a high dimensional set you can think of this as this shaded region here and then there are these islands instability islands and whenever the system goes through these islands you have an extreme event so obviously when you start sampling this problem you will not be interested to explore all the shaded region. Remember, this shaded region can be really high dimensional, but you are primarily interested on these green islands. On the other hand, there might be green islands which are completely exotic and they will never be uh, you know, seen by the, by the dynamics. So you don't want to spend resources for these either. So there is somewhere in the middle, like the, 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 uh, the sweet spot is somewhere in the middle. So we start thinking instead of the input as you know, typical criteria that I presented, uh, think, we start thinking in terms of the output. And one way, good way to think of the output is the actual probability density function of the output, right? So what if we try to achieve or find the next most informative point so that we have the fastest convergence for the probability density function of y directly. And um, so this is the map. This is what I described before, right? We were trying to find x to minimize the variance or the integral of the variance. But keep in mind that we have a probability density function for x, which means that if we have a regression, if we have this map y bar, we also have the PDF of y bar, right? That's from a quick Monte Carlo simulation. And um, the other idea we had was that we also have the probability density function of this perturbed model, which is y bar plus beta times the standard deviation, right? We call this y bar plus. So you can think of this y bar plus as the worst case scenario, okay? So these are the two PDFs, the PDF of the output produced with the mean model and the PDF of the output produced with the perturbed model the worst case scenario model. Ideally, we would like these two to be on top of each other. If that's the case, it means that we don't need any more samples. We have converged. Keep in mind, however, that if these are on top of each other, if these two densities have converged, it does not mean that this map has converged. And that's, if you want, the, the, the key point here, that this is a much a weaker uh, condition compared with the original one of having the full map converging, uh, we require the map of, I mean, the PDFs for the output to converge. So I have a was, quick, sorry, I have a quick question about this, uh, this figure. Yeah. Um, so you're taking the, the PDF for, for just Y, that's the blue distribution. Right. And then to make the red distribution, you're adding, you're adding and subtracting this Sigma function. So is it, 
shouldn't the support of the red distribution always be bigger than the support of the blue distribution? That's a great question. I have not talked at all about the support. Now, the support will be predefined and it will be smaller than both of the two supports. Like we will define the region of extreme events that we're interested in. Typically, this is in terms of standard deviation. So let's say we're interested up to four standard deviations, right away from the mean. Mm -hmm. And this would be the region where we will compare the two densities. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. All right, yeah, like numerically. Otherwise, and I mean, you will see why we need to go there and uh, we cannot take infinite support, even if the densities are infinite supported. So we are trying to define um, a distance, uh, if you want, between the output PDFs and, and try to, to define some notion of convergence through the lenses of the output PDF. And we do that by considering directly the L1 distance between the logarithms of the PDFs. Now, note that this is different from the standard KL divergence that uh, is very popular for two reasons. The KL divergence, uh, we actually, it's much easier to define because you are not suffering from, uh, you know, infinite uh, values at infinity, which is what's happening here. However, you lose a lot of information when it comes to extreme events. So extreme events are associated with very low probabilities. And if you want, if you use KL divergence, this is, this is not going to be seen very well, um, simply because you will multiply this quantity, this difference with the probability function itself. So we are focusing basically on what you see on this graph, right? We are trying to measure the L1 distance between the logarithms of these two PDFs over a compact support. And as I said, this support can be defined in terms of the standard deviations that we're interested in. And that's directly the optimization problem we are defining to identify the next most informative point. We will find the point which results in the maximum, um, uh, if you want, um, minimization of, of this difference. Uh, it's obvious that, uh, again, the logarithm, it's considered like that because we are emphasizing the tails. That's what we are after. Now, in terms of what information do we use here, Keep in mind that compared with uncertainty sampling, we now have the PDF of the output, which it's essentially contains information for the model, as you can see here, but also information for the input. So all of the pieces are basically included in this analysis. So this is work we did back in 2018, and we tried to solve this problem directly. Um, and we did. I will just show you an application here. We started from a jones swap spectrum. This is basically the spectral density of ocean waves. Um, we, are, we want to make this a finite dimensional problem. So we are parameterizing these random waves uh, with a particular way. We essentially represent them as wave groups of a random length scale x1 and random amplitude x2. In fact, you can take this John Schwab spectral density and transform it into a probability density function for these random parameters for the wave group X1 and X2, right? This is this cloud. So now the question is, if I have a structure, I have this uh, CFD experiment, it's an offshore platform that is subjected to any wave I want. And this CFD experiment, just to give you a sense, it takes more or less a couple of days to, um, in, on a GPU to compute um, the response of the structure of the platform um, over one to two minutes of wave excitation. So you understand how expensive these computations are. And we don't want, of course, to compute over, over thousands of wave groups. Hopefully we can do this calculation with very, very few. So we employ this criterion and we're interested on in the probability density function for the stresses, the, the torques actually, and uh, the forces acting on the structure, right? This is the quantity of interest. So using this acquisition function, we are doing the optimization at every iteration, and we're able with 16 iterations to identify the probability density function for uh, the structural moments acting on, uh, on, on this system. So that, that was, uh, if you want, a success story, but it didn't go very far. And the reason is 
this optimization problem, the very optimization problem we defined at the beginning. And uh, let me be more precise. In fact, what we call the elephant in the room here is the dimensionality. It's really, really hard to optimize this, uh, this problem that I presented in dimensionalities bigger than three or four. So um, that was an issue. And uh, we wanted to, uh, it was clear that we had to derive an alternative acquisition function that hopefully respects the properties that I tried to emphasize, um, meaning, you know, take into account the output, but also be computationally tractable for higher dimensional problems. So this is a result that came uh, more recently. And in fact, it basically says that if you consider this quantity I presented before, and beta is this small parameter that you, uh, based on which you define the perturb model. So the perturb model is the mean model plus beta times the standard deviation. So if you take beta very, very small, and it doesn't really change as much if you take beta small, you can prove this asymptotic bound that basically says that the quantity I described, this difference of the logs can be bounded by the posterior variance, uh, which is a good quantity, easy to compute and optimize, times the density of the input. And that's the key thing now, the new thing, it's the denominator. It's divided by the probability density function of the output, right? At the value of the output. Now let's see why this is uh, a good thing, why this is a nice uh, interpretation. So, first of all, um, we are taking into account the error, right? So we are trying to minimize the error of the model. That's a good thing. We are weighting the error of the model according to the probability density function of the input. That's also a good thing, right? We want to exclude inputs that are completely exotic and will never happen. And we are dividing or we're giving emphasis on large outputs. Remember, large outputs are associated with low probability, which means that being the denominator, the probability of the output, it penalizes more according to the probability, according to how large or how unusual this output event is. And there is a nice balance here between likelihood of, I mean, probability of the input divided by the probability of the output. So this is the ratio we will be using. Now, in terms of computations, this is very easy to compute. In fact, we can do, we can compute its gradient pretty easily. So we can apply all the nice tools of gradient optimization. Um, we call this the likelihood weighted acquisition function. Now, Another question we asked ourselves was how close we are. Okay, we derived this asymptotic, you know, upper bound. How close we are to the optimal? And uh, in order to define optimality, uh, well, we first need to define what optimality is in this context, right? So let's think of the following. Um, we define the best possible choice of acquisition function for a given map. Suppose we know, well, we have the map right, why, of course, this is a priori unknown, but let's for a second assume that we have it. Then we have our mean model here. Our goal would be to find a next star, the next point, so that these two come as close as possible, okay? That would be, of course, if we had this way, that would be great. But the problem is that we don't really know what is why a priori. So, <clears throat> Instead of defining the criteria the way I just described, we are taking the supremum of this quantity over all possible y's, right? That are consistent with the data that we have so far. So this is basically the, what it's called in Gaussian process regression, the reproducing kernel Herbert space, right? So the, kernel, the reproducing kernel Herbert space, you can think of them as, as, a, as a collection of functions, as a family of functions, it's a, a functional space, in fact, that is consistent with the data and it's sufficiently smooth. So we take this collection of, of functions and we define um, the acquisition function with respect to the supremum over this functional space. 
So that will be the optimal acquisition process, right? To identify X star, so the supremum over this functional space of the quantity we're interested is minimized. Now, uh, excuse me. I'm yes, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, may I, uh, Tim, I uh, ask another question? The the y bar n is an approximation to y, right? So if you yes. optimize over all y, that also then uh, affects the y bars, right? No, because the y bar it's um, uh, the y bar is built based on the points that all the y's respect. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay, fine. Okay. Thank you. No, no, I'm, I'm happy that, uh, you know, for these questions, which, uh, because I mean, hopefully they will lead to an interesting discussion at the end. Um, so that's the quantity we want to, to minimize if we want to do things optimally. Now, computational, this is obviously an intractable minimax problem, right? Infinite dimensional in one variable, high dimensional in the other variable. We don't want to mess with it. So we were able to show this, this nice result that asymptotically, meaning for small, sufficiently small sigma, um, you can prove uh, that this supremum of the difference, uh, it's exactly equal to this weighted version of the posterior standard deviation, right? Let's, let's uh, see it more carefully. So we have the standard deviation on the right-hand side, sigma n, and then we have several weights, the probability density function of the input, the derivative of the probability density function of the output, and the PDF of the output squared in the denominator. This starts reminding of the output weighted criteria I mentioned before. It's not exactly the same, though. This is what this theorem gave us. Um, there are certain, you know, ingredients for the proof. I don't want to get into the details. I'm, I'm, the, the, the paper is available, and I can discuss if, if needed. But um, and also the other point I want to make is that one can go to higher order terms if you need, and uh, there are reasons for that as well, uh, and we can discuss more. Meaning you can find the second and third order corrections. Um, okay, now the question is, what about the other one, the upper bound I just described? Does this um, connect with the, the one I derived here, the rigorous one? Well, the answer is that it does, and it's just a cauchy schwartz inequality away, if you want. You can use cauchy schwartz and so that uh, you can obtain the other criterion I described, the um, um, upper bound criterion through a cauchy schwartz inequality. Uh, and we will be working with this upper bound instead of the um, strict, uh, you know, like uh, equality, uh, simply because sigma square behaves much uh, nicer, at least in the context of Gaussian process regression. You know, it's easier to compute its derivative. It's easier to do things numerically with sigma square rather than sigma. So for the examples you will see in what follows, we will be working with this uh, upper bound. Um, as I said, for larger sigmas, if you have a reason that you want optimality from the, from the very few iterations where your sigma may be large, you can derive higher order terms. Um, and we have done this. And um, it's interesting going back to the previous to a previous question about the gradient, that in higher order terms, when you go to sigma four, sigma six, uh, the uh, Hessian of of the of the uh, of y appears. So it starts, you know, the geometry and the curvature kicks in, and basically sending you sampling regions with higher, not just with higher values of y, but with higher curvature of y. Okay. Uh, there are there is a similar result for the convergence of the map. I don't want to, to spend a lot of time on this. I want to jump into some um, examples and uh, some applications. So I will start with the UQ of a 20 dimensional linear function, right? This is the linear function, the simplest possible example, but it's 20 dimensional. Uh, the coefficients of the linear function A hat are shown here. It's the black curve with respect to the index. So you see that low index inputs basically have no influence on the output. Uh, 
I index uh, inputs. They are the ones that dominate the output. And the variance of its input variable is shown with red, okay? So this is how things work. We basically want to identify samples. We collect samples based on the acquisition functions I described and try to see what causes the fastest convergence. So convergence is meant in terms of the variance of the output, right? And you see that if we do this randomly with Monte Carlo, for example, I just randomly pick you know, uh, samples. Um, I will have the blue curve uh, as, as convergence. If I do input weighted, meaning the integrated virus reduction that I described before without taking into account the output, then it's very, very close to the Monte Carlo. It does not give you much. The reason is because it's basically sampling according to the variance of the input, right? So it will start from the low indices and the high indices and it will move towards the center. On the other hand, if you use the likelihood weighted, very quickly it identifies where the action is, basically the high indices, and we'll focus there. You can see that from the plots on the right. The plots on the right, they show you what samples are being picked with respect to the number of iterations. So you see that integrated virus reduction, it starts from low and high indices, and it moves towards the center, and then again, it repeats, right? Until the uncertainty is more or less everywhere the same. And in the likelihood weighted, very quickly it understands that the important variables are the one with high indices and it's focusing on sampling there. And then as the arrow goes down, it more or less starts sampling uniformly. So that's, that's if you want a little example to show the mechanics of how this works. We have done work on applying this for the statistics of the vertical bending moment for, for SIPs. So here we have um, a stochastic C, which is the rule for, for ocean waves. Uh, things are stochastic. We represent the ocean waves through a cahorn loyal series. Um, and we also represent the vertical bending moment. Uh, and here is like the, the numerical experiment. We are interested to identify the statistics for the vertical bending moment at the mid sip section. Uh, and we want to do that with the minimum number of simulations, right? So in other words, we want to quantify this map where alpha is the coefficients associated with the wave groups, with the waves hitting the SIP, and Q are the current life coefficients associated with the vertical bending moment. Um, there is a challenge here. The challenge is that if you choose the wave group hitting your SIP with very, very small time interval, then you lose a lot of transients and you have increased model uncertainty. If you use a very, very large time window to represent your wave groups, then inevitably you will have a very high dimensional alpha space, which means that you will have to deal with very complex uh, functions. So there is a sweet spot again there. I don't want to get into a lot of details about that because this is problem specific, but we are able with order of 40, 45 experiments to identify uh, or to recover, if you want, the um, probability density function for the vertical bending moment, which as you can see, it's completely non-trivial, right? It's asymmetric with uh, some heavy tails on the left. Um, and we're able to do that with only 44 experiments. Um, just to give you a sense to obtain the Monte Carlo simulation, you need thousands of hours of simulation of meaning, uh, you know, actual time to do that can take like uh, several weeks uh, versus 44 numerical experiments, which is uh, several minutes. Um, finally, I want to talk about uh, a dispersive uh, wave model for weak turbulence. This is another example, uh, more complicated than the one I presented before. Um, where the idea, again, you have this dispersive wave model. It's a variation of nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Um, you have a dispersion relation of deep water waves and the nonlinearity of, uh, you know, the standard cubic nonlinearity plus selective dissipation. So it kills the high frequencies. And um, if you run this, like this is a realization, right? This is space and time and you see the extreme events that appear out of nowhere. And the goal is to identify the probability density function for this, for this system. This is the PDF, just to give you a sense of what we are after. 
So here, because of the high dimensionality of the problem, um, we are uh, adopting a neural network approach. Uh, this is an operator neural network. I don't want to stick into a particular you know, regression model. So here we're using optimal, uh, I mean, uh, operator neural networks. Someone may use another, uh, you know, neural network. Uh, the important thing is that we have to move away from Gaussian process regression because it's the dimensionality of the input space is higher than order of five or six Gaussian process regression is not behaving very well. So here we are representing the initial conditions as stochastic, and this is in a, a finite dimensional approximation. Theta is the finite dimensional vector that defines the initial conditions. The black box takes us, which is the, the, the simulator. It gives us the quantity of interest, which is the spatial maximum of the real part of the response. And um, we are applying the same protocol, but again, instead of doing Gaussian process regression, we have an ensemble of uh, neural networks. And here you will see for a two-dimensional projection, how things are being explored, right? So this is the two-dimensional input space. And uh, here you see the logarithm of the, of the standard deviation, the logarith of the weight, and this is the actual acquisition function. And you see how the convergence uh, happens for the output PDF. It's pretty quickly. This is again for a two-dimensional approximation. As we move to higher dimensionality, uh, this is for an eight-dimensional uh, situation. And uh, I'm presenting this eight-dimensional space um, through this multi-dimensional scaling. It's a visualization approach. So you can see things that live in eight-dimensional space on your screen. Um, and Again, you can see the very fast uh, convergence um, and how the sampling takes place, right? You see there is a core that is being sampled and then there are these wings associated with extreme events. How do we compare with other criteria? Hey, sorry, I have a question about of this course, previous yeah. slide with the neural network. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so whenever we're adding additional points, so when, when we, we select a point using this acquisition function, at, gets added to our data. Are we then retraining the neural network on that data? Yes, um, yes, we have. Because I, I guess for Gaussian process, it's easy. You can just recompute the variance, but you have to completely retrain the network. Okay, I will tell you the bad news and the good news. The bad news is that yes, we do have to train, but the good news is that we don't have to train every iteration. We can train, that's what we are calling batching. We can train every 50 or every 100 iterations. So in turn, iterations, you mean? Uh, so, so, selective yeah. points. Okay, so, so every 50 points you then retrain, okay. Right, you use, so you take the acquisition function and you find the 50 maximum points. Oh, I see. I see. You Thank choose them, you run the experiment for these 50 points, and then you retrain your neural network with 50 extra points. And that significantly accelerates and without any uh, any real loss on your performance. Like, again, it depends on the dimensionality. If you go to high dimensions, you cannot train every point because you will need thousands of points. So it makes no sense. Sometimes we do batching with 200 uh, samples per iteration. So this is for a 20 dimensional problem. And here batching it's happening every 100 points. And it's interesting to see how things uh, operate if you have, for example, lightning hypercube sampling, you have a double descent. You start converging and then you diverge until you go to several, many, many thousands of points and then you will start converging again. If you use uh, uncertainty sampling, meaning, meaning, meaning minimizing your variance, you will still have a uh, double descent. If you do likelihood weighted uncertainty sampling, then you get away. You see, you have monotonic convergence um of 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 your error right and this is the pdf again error um what is the key thing well by doing this likelihood weighted approach we are able to essentially recover waves that initially are small and eventually get large if you do light in hypercube sampling this is what i'm showing here on the left you essentially discover big waves that will stay big or be, may become even bigger. Uh, but you don't really get into the core of the problem, which is finding the waves that are initially small and then get bigger, which is what the likelihood weight it is able to do. Um, so 
I don't want, like I have uh, nine more minutes. I have uh, many more slides and I'm glad we are, I'm, I'm, I mean, we have this interactive or, you know, like uh, you are asking questions. Uh, I can quickly go, uh, not through all the slides, of course, but to give you an idea how this can be used for optimization. I think this is simple. And um, then I will leave five, six minutes at the end for, for questions. So this is all that I discussed for uncertain quantification. The thing is that these tools can also be used for optimization. For optimization, we're not just interested for the map and the resulted PDF, we're interested for the minimum or the maximum of this map. So that has to be natural. It can be naturally integrated within the acquisition function, basically, it's the acquisition function I just described, plus the cost function associated with minimizing the function itself, right? So um, standard criteria, it's this exploration exploitation thing that I mentioned before, standard criteria like integrated variance reduction, you basically try to minimize your variance, integrated variance, plus your function, right? And there are other variations like lower confidence, bound probability of improvement, experiment improvement. We can write for all of those criteria the likelihood weighted versions um, by basically uh, adding to the likelihood weighted criteria, which are exploration criteria, the function itself. And that results a new class of um, acquisition functions for Bayesian optimization that we have tried on several problems, standard benchmarks, uh, like this is uh, functions that people use in the active learning community, six-dimensional Hartmann and 10-dimensional Mikhailovich function. And we have um, the, the, the best performance with this likelihood weighted criteria. Uh, in most cases, I would say uh, the majority of the problems. There are problems where we may have, you know, deficiencies or there are special issues, but in general, uh, the, these criteria, they do at least as well as the best criterion that is in the literature. Uh, this is for a more like classical mechanics problem, like right? the Brachistochron problem, where again, we discretize the trajectory in 10 points, and then we are trying to optimize the location of these 10 points. Uh, and before I close, I want to uh, present one example related to um, optimal sensor placement or multi-arm banded problems. So the idea, this is joint work with uh, Paris Perdicaris, Professor Perdicaris from UPenn. And um, the idea is where, if you have a complex environment, where should one place the sensors to presumably minimize the variance or identify uh, the maximum you know, value of, of a field? So this is very popular in the computer science as the multi-arm bandit problem. Basically, you have uh, these this multi-arm bandits and you don't, want, you don't know what, are the, what is the probability to win uh, when you pull its arm. And the question is how, what strategy one should develop to, to maximize the gains, right? So you, what you typically do, you start by exploring things, and then eventually you have to use the knowledge you obtain as you from the exploration phase to start exploiting and maximizing your your gains. So we apply this idea uh, of optimization, based optimization, and the, uh, a data set that is very popular is for this problem is the Berkeley Research Lab temperatures collected by 46 thermostats there. So this is a room, uh, the, the lab, it has 50, I believe 50 plus 54 sensors. And the scenario is that we want to identify the maximum temperature in the room by activating the smallest number of sensors, okay? So um, we are able to run this with different algorithms. A very popular algorithm in this case is the Thompson sampling. Uh, and then we have all the criteria that I discussed very briefly before, the expected improvement, upper confidence bounds, and so on. Likelihood weighted upper confidence bound, again, is, is the winner when it comes to exploring or identifying the spatial maxima, right? If you try to build the whole field 
of course, it will not give you much. But if you try to identify where is the maximum, it will uh, perform the best. So um, I want to, uh, to close by some uh, remarks and challenges. Um, so some challenges and limitations, right? Uh, dimensionality and regression, they are not good friends, at least high dimensionality and regression. Um, we don't, well, we try to, to improve things in that regard, meaning that we are giving an approach or providing a method that said, allows you to select points more carefully, even in high dimensional settings, but does not solve the high dimensional regression issues, right? That, that are there. We, in other words, we assume that we have some tool that can operate in high dimensional problems. Neural networks, you know, they're good candidates, but of course they have their own uh, problems. Um, uh, the other thing that I want to emphasize, I think is an important step uh, wearing my engineering hat, is that uh, for this type of problems, it's essential, although I didn't do much along this line, I didn't present much along these lines, to somehow encode dynamics in the representations. So all the, all the tools I presented, Gaussian regression, neural nets, and so on, you know, they're, they're physics models agnostic. They're basically statistical tools, very, very powerful, but they do not encode uh, the actual dynamics. And when we're dealing with dynamical systems, it is important to encode, for example, conservation properties, uh, you know, causality analysis. Uh, there is a plethora of tools that uh, basically can, may allow us to obtain smarter representations that uh, actually encode dynamics and then the challenge would be how to use these ideas, optimal experimental design ideas with domain knowledge in parametric representations to uh, achieve the goal, which is fast UQ and fast optimization. So with this, I would like to, um, to, to close and uh, I'm happy uh, to take any questions. I leave the summary slide for anyone who is interested. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Sam. It's very, very interesting. Um...